Hey, I'm John. Thanks for joining me for this video. In this video, I'm going to be building Citadel's Adeptus Mechanicus Scorpius Disintegrator. How's that for a long title? It's a really cool model. Um, all of these sides, these flat sides, these corners, they just scream weathering. That's why I got this. I didn't get it because of its looks, because it looks kind of goofy. I definitely got this because I am going to weather the heck out of this thing. So um, that should be a really fun process. Now the kit's actually a pretty good value. You can build one of two vehicles. You can build the disintegrator that I'm going to build, or you can build the Scorpius Dune Rider, which is more of a landing craft. So if you want to have the opportunity to weather the inside of something where people walk in and out, um, and it's going to, I'm sure it would get quite scuffed up. You can build this and uh, have a lot of fun with that too. But I like the, the big honking gun on the top of the disintegrator version. So that's what I'm going to be sticking with. Now the instructions are divided up into three sections. Part one carries you through the building of the common part of the hull that's common to both versions. Um, and it's, if you've ever, if you've never built a Citadel kit, they make it really simple. I mean, they number their parts, but most of them are so distinct. Uh, you don't need numbering. It's, it's not snap fit, but it's almost like Lego. You just, you just kind of put them together and glue it. Um, I did decide that some of the parts, like these bumpers along the bottom and these grab rails here and these tail fin parts here, I'm going to leave those off, and a few others, the turret and a few others. I'm going to leave those off in the initial painting and weathering so that I can work just on the hull. Um, because there's, for the disintegrator version, like for example, you have this turret here. And that, while it just snaps right on, I'm going to paint and do most of the weathering for that off of the main hull. And... Uh, just a few other parts like that so that it will facilitate uh, ease of painting and things like that. You could build the whole thing if you wanted to, um, but I feel like, for example, where the, the bumpers are around the bottom here, I feel like those would be kind of difficult to weather under it evenly because of where they sit. So I'll paint and do most of the weathering on those, paint these and weather these separate. Then when I put them on there, then I'll do some additional weathering to represent how weathering would interact with those. And I think that'll work really well. At least that's the theory. <laughs> I've assembled the hull uh, to the point you see here. My goal was to get it to where I could paint it, but not have any problems running into the greeblies. Um, there's a lot of little things hanging off of the, the exterior of this model. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't uh, have anything that would interfere with painting and weathering. But I also test fitted everything to make sure that I could glue it on later without a problem. Now there's these metal bumpers, I guess you'd say, that go around the lower part of the hull. And I did make sure that those could be fitted later without any problem. So they'll be painted a separate color. And then there's just a few major sections of parts that need to go on afterwards. Uh, there's a couple of tail fins that go on the back. And uh, then there's some steps that go up the side. Those can be kind of hard to weather under. There's the turret that will go on the top. And then some gun barrels that go around the, the model in different areas. The turret features this kind of weird cyborg guy. And I did have to leave that disassembled. Uh, the turret disassembled so I could paint him, but that should be fun to paint him. Um, he's kind of weird. And then I took two of the gun options and merged them into one, so it's got one really big honking gun. Now, you'll see when you assemble um, any Citadel model, most models have this, but Citadel models, there will be areas that, while they go together nicely, there are some gaps and cracks that are supposed to be panel lines. So to fill those, um, I always turn to Mr. Surfacer 500. Uh, it's my favorite product for doing this. Now, the goal is not to fill it fully, but to just get rid of the cracks so that I can put in washes. You always want to give it a good stir with Mr. Uh, your Mr. Surfacer 500 with an electric stir tool. 
Don't shake it. Don't try and stir it with a stick or you'll be there all day. Get you one of these electric stir tools because it makes life so much easier. Now, I just painted on the Mr. Surfacer, and I apologize for not having the footage. I somehow lost that, but I just painted it on with a brush until all the cracks were filled. Um, not the panel lines filled, but the cracks between the panel lines. That's what I was going for. So, um, and I gave it maybe half an hour to dry. It doesn't need a whole lot of drying time when you're using this method. Half an hour should work. I grabbed some cotton buds. Uh, to help me with removing the excess. And I also grabbed some 91% isopropyl alcohol that will help uh, with, with this process. And all I do is I take the cotton bud and I dip it into the alcohol and I start rubbing it. Simple as that. Um, it will lift up the Mr. Surfacer that's on the flat exterior, but it doesn't get down into the gaps and the cracks uh, where you want it to be filled so it, it gives it a, a good cleanup and again this works on any model I've used it on every genre that I build and you just go around and continue cleaning it up you don't want to wait too long I've stretched it as far as 12 hours um, but you don't want to wait too long I, it leaves a little bit of a a film but you can leave that priming over it will get rid of it now I went ahead and primed the model off camera um, uh, just for logistical reasons with with where I air, airbrush it's kind of hard to get set up and I used uh, Vallejo surface primer which I've not used before um, to any great degree I used this German red brown I thought it would be a good undercoat for the red color to come the primer dries very nicely um, it, it's a bit fragile when you first put it on so you have to be careful with handling it once it's had 24 hours to cure it's very smooth it looks very good it's reasonably durable for an acrylic primer but I gotta say it gunked up my airbrush something awful even with a little bit of thinning so I don't know that I'm gonna make this my go-to primer anymore for the base paint I use this game color gory red it's a close equivalent to the corn red that's the recommended color from citadel i, I really like this color um, i thinned it with of course vallejo airbrush thinner i thinned it fairly heavily um, almost thin enough for airbrush use uh, and, and i went with this flat brush because when i'm painting a large area like this i think the flat brush works really well um, with thinned paint to get a nice smooth coat when you're when you're brushing it on but you have to be careful in the application um, I dab off most of the paint and I begin a, a, a brush stroke that more closely resembles dry brushing but I let the the paint fully cover the model I keep the strokes in one direction in this case vertical up and down Every now and then, if I have to go in a different direction, um, say to, to get around bolt detail or something like that, I'll do a brief diversion, I guess you'd say, into that different uh, direction and then go right back over it with the vertical strokes. In some areas, the paint will pool a little bit. I just keep working it. Um, if, if you do this technique and the paint's looking very thick, streaky and thick try saying that 10 times fast you're probably using uh, too much paint and not enough thinner thin it out and keep working it with these strokes and you should get a nice smooth coat once it dries it may look a little lumpy when you first put it on but once you're finished uh, and the paint starts drying out it won't be quite as good as an airbrush uh, only an airbrush can do what an airbrush can do but for brush painting this gives a very nice smooth appearance and for this genre especially is is very appropriate with the smaller ancillary pieces I use the same technique the same brush but a lot less paint on the brush because the parts are smaller and you're not wanting to move as much paint around 
but it's the exact same process to get this base color on here. Now I wanted to do a little bit of overpainting um, that is a dry brush step, but I wanted to use it more as something to add some tonal variation. You see the the stroke that I'm doing here, I'm rubbing it into the paint. I'm not doing a traditional dry brush, although I switch to it every now and then when I hit some edges. But what this does is it simulates in many ways post shading, uh, adding uh, some lighter paint to the model. And you see there I got a little heavy on that that edge there, but I can go back later when I'm weathering and clean that up. But this in many ways adds something that works much like modulation uh, so it, it helps some of the highlights stand out it helps some of the major panels that stand up um, stand out and when I'm done it just gives it a very nice in my opinion varied uh, look that is a good basis for uh, the later work to come and it, it breaks up that monotone look of that color and it starts moving it towards a more weathered, uh, patchy finish. The next step was to do traditional dry brushing with this Wild Rider Red, uh, which is a, a very bright color, good for edge highlighting on uh, anything red. Now, I could have done the traditional Citadel edge highlights, brush painted them on, but I feel like for something this size the dry brushing works better because this is the color that I'm going to use as the first chipping color um, anywhere that I get maybe a little heavy-handed with the dry brushing it won't be a problem it'll fit right in with the chipping that I'm going to do later and here I'm a little more focused on the edges I'm not trying to to uh, add much modulation or tonal variety and I just do the regular dry brushing and the red that I'm left with is a nice uh, base for everything else to come. The details show up, there's some tonal variation, and uh, I think it looks pretty cool. Now there was a white stripe shown on the painting instructions that I wanted to uh, simulate. So the first thing I do when I'm masking off a stripe like that is I detack the masking tape so that there's less of a chance that it will uh, lift paint when I pull it off and I masked off that area and I'm gonna I'm gonna paint this with a sponge uh, starting off with Screaming Skull the reason I use a sponge is to keep from uh, letting paint run under that tape anytime you're brush painting it can be fairly easy to for the paint to run under the masking. When you're doing the sponge method, um, building it up slowly, you're less likely to have paint go under there. And if it does, it's gonna be easier to sell as chipping. So there you see the first layer of it. It's not complete. I'm just gonna go ahead and build in some chipping on this. And then I switch to uh, the cold white color for the second layer. And I do the same application here. Uh, just applying it with the sponge. I'm a little heavier this time going for a little more coverage but not full coverage. And you see how that looks there. And then when I remove the tape I pull it back against itself. Um, I don't just yank it off. I pull it off slowly. I like using tweezers so I can um, kind of get better control of it. And I just pull off the tape a section at a time and as I get further along in the section I reach back grab another part and continue pulling and there you see the stripe and it looks pretty good it's already pre weathered and uh, it's a little further ahead than the rest of the model but I like the way it looks and uh, I'll go with that the painting guide shows quite a bit of uh, silver detail on here and I wanted to get as much of that as I could uh, so I use this Citadel Lead Belcher uh, one of my favorite colors to use for basing silver and I switched to the Army Painter Regiment brush uh, it's a great brush um, if you're looking for a, a very versatile detail painting brush for things like this 
and I just begin painting on the details. For those pipes, I like to paint the top edge of it, give that a little time to dry, then flip the angle of the model and paint one side and then the other, getting it close to the edge but not completely right up to it because later washes will even up that edge. I also like to base the vision ports in a brighter color. I chose the lead belcher here. There will be later colors that go over that. And there's a lot of decorative elements on Warhammer 40k uh, models. And you may choose to not paint those. I like to do it. I think they look cool. And then there's just lots of other bits. You have to really look at the painting guide and look at the model itself because um, there's no hard and fast rules, you know, paint it how you want. Uh, and I had to make sure that I didn't forget the uh, additional parts that would be added on later. Uh, sometimes I'll do that. I'll paint the main model and then get a few days down the road meaning to do later steps and find that I'd left all of these smaller later parts. So I made sure to get those. And of course I gave the cyborg, I'm starting to call him Weird Harold. Um, I gave him a good coat of lead belch or two so that uh, I can do later washes and some other effects on that, but lead belcher will be a good base for this guy. The next color that I wanted to add at this stage of the building was this Zandri dust. Uh, you see this a lot on Adeptus Mechanicus uh, faction models, and it's just used for a lot of trim and interior color and stuff like that. Note that the paint is very, very thin. Um, when I'm brushing it on like this, I want to get it in multiple thin coats, um, usually at least two or three. So the first coat, if you put it on like this, is going to look really streaky. Um, it's not going to be the best looking paint job in the world. But when you put it on very thin like that and then build up multiple coats, you get good coverage. So you'll see here that I'm starting the second coat, and that's bringing it up almost to full opacity. There'll be a few places that I need to touch up, but that's going to get it fairly well. And then once I have all of it on there, and this was, I think at most I did maybe two coats with a third touch up in some places. Um, and you see that it gives it good coverage. This is going to be kind of an interior part where not much of it is going to be seen. So I didn't necessarily go for, you know, showroom look. But it's definitely, um, a, a you can brush paint smoothly. You can brush paint with full opacity. You just have to get a, give it a little time to develop the color, and uh, everything should go well. The color guide shows several locations for decals, and I'm only going to use a few of them on this build. The sheet that comes with the kit is very complete, but I'm only going to use four of them. Not too many. I start by putting on a dot of future where I want the decal to go. I'm not going to gloss coat the entire model uh, because that's going to interfere with some of the finishing techniques that I want to add later. So for this number of decals, I just float the decal right onto a little puddle of future, use my X-Acto knife to get it positioned in place, um, which is living dangerously, but I've done it plenty before, so I'm comfortable doing that. And then I just grab a cotton bud and roll it across the decal carefully to uh, squeegee out any of the remaining future that's under the decal. And there you pretty quickly have a nice decal without a whole gloss coat. All right, well, I think I'm going to call this a wrap on this episode. I've gotten it to the point of being painted and decaled. Uh, there's obviously still some details to be painted. Uh, the weathering is yet to come but I think this is a good breaking point to, uh, to get things up to. Uh, otherwise, I, the video may go for a very, very long time, and neither one of us probably want that. But this is a fun kit. Uh, it assembles well. It, it looks very unique. I don't, think, I don't think there's anything else in the world that looks like this. Um, so uh, I can definitely recommend this if you've been wanting to try out something Warhammer. Um, this is, this is a cool one that will look great on your shelf. Well, thanks so much for watching. I am so very grateful, especially if you've made it to this point. Thank you for hanging in there. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the things that I've covered in getting it to this point. And, of course, the, the next episode will be uh, about weathering and finishing the detail painting and all of that. 
So be sure and click the subscribe button down there and hit the little bell icon so you'll know when this uh, comes out and, and you won't miss out on finishing this guy up. There's also links below to my website, to the social media that I'm on, um, and there is a link to Patreon. And I would be most grateful if you would consider uh, clicking on that link and looking at what I have to offer on Patreon and possibly supporting me. Uh, that's what makes this possible. I wouldn't be able to do the modeling at the pace that I do with the materials that I do and all of that if it weren't for Patreon support. And so uh, that really helps me out. If you have the ability to do that, I'd be grateful. And if you're already a Patreon supporter, thank you so much uh, for, for coming along with me and helping me in this journey. And I hope that the rewards you're getting, uh, that you find beneficial in, in your support. So uh, thank you very much. And a final word, if you're not having fun in this hobby, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.